Hello, it's Mama Ward. Today we're going to read Hurricanes, Earth's Mightiest Storms by Patricia Lauber. This is what I'll be grading. A monster storm. The storm was born sometime in late summer of 1938, somewhere in tropical waters of the North Atlantic Ocean. No one saw it. No one tracked it. And that time, whether satellites did not exist or no ship happened near the young storm, unseen and unknown, it began a long journey. Winds nudged and shoved the storm westward across the Atlantic. As it traveled, the storm fed on warm, moist air. It grew into a huge mass of dark clouds. Within the clouds, lightning crackled. Thunder crashed and strong winds howled. Sheets of rain fell, still unseen. The powerful storm was whirling toward North America. By the time it drew near, it was full-fledged hurricane, carrying winds of at least 70 miles an hour. First word of the storm came by radio on September 16th after a Brazilian freighter met hurricane winds and heavy seas northeast of Puerto Rico. Reports from other ships followed. At the United States Weather Bureau in Jacksonville, Florida, weather scientists began fitting reports together. They soon learned that a monster hurricane was bearing down on Florida. Unless it changed course, it was strike near Miami on the evening of Tuesday, September 20th, they issued an urgent hurricane warning. In and around Miami, people boarded up windows, doubled mooring lines and their boats, and laid in supplies of food, water, batteries, and candles. They knew how to get ready. The past 10 years had brought them 11 hurricanes and 10 storms of near hurricane strength. But the hurricane did not strike. By Monday night, it had turned north. Everyone relaxed. The storm seemed to be following a path taken by many other hurricanes. It would move north toward Cape Haters, North Carolina then turn east, dying out over cool waters. The national weather map for Wednesday, September 21st, did not even show a hurricane, just a storm moving out to sea. Yet the truth was that no one really knew where the hurricane was or what it was doing. No one knew that the hurricane was still headed north, that it had not turned out to sea. No one knew that the hurricane had picked up speed. It was no longer traveling at 20 miles an hour. It was rowing along at 60 or 70, as fast as a tornado. No one knew that the whirling winds within the storm were gusting to 200 miles an hour. No one knew that the hurricane was burying towards the northeast coast. Even as the edge of the storm was tearing up boardwalks and piers along the New Jersey shore, no warnings were sent ahead. The people of Long Island and New England had no reason to expect anything worse than some stormy weather. No giant hurricane had struck the region in 123 years since September 23rd, 1815. The south shore of Long Island faces the Atlantic. 
It is sheltered only by islands of sand called buried beaches. Along these beaches, people had built everything from summer cottages to large houses. West Hampton Beach, for instance, had 179 houses on a strip of sand that was 10 miles long and a quarter of a mile wide. This barrier beach stood squarely in the path of the storm that no one was expecting. Because it was early fall, most of the summer people had gone home. Those still at the beach were awed by the size of the ocean waves on the morning of September, on Wednesday, September 21st. A few even called friends and invited them to drive out over the bridge to see the waves. In early afternoon, wind struck. Deck chairs and shutters swooped through the air like leaves. Roof shingles ripped and tore loose. Windows blew in. Doors blew open. The sky turned black. Telephone poles snapped. Rain fell in sheets sweeping through broken windows and open doors. Water crept up around houses. Then the sea struck. Wow, at this damage. The town of West Hampton was littered with wreckage of its own and from West Hampton Beach. The big house at right road out the storm. The one at left was torn from its foundation. I was looking at the picture all the time. Three hours before high tide, water reached the high tide mark. Then came a wall of water that happened to be 40 feet high a storm surge. People who saw the storm surge thought it was a thick bank of fog rolling in, but it wasn't fog, it was water. Water that crushed and swept away everything in its path. Cottages crumbled. Whole houses were lifted off their foundation and smashed to pieces. Terrified by the wind and rain that came before the surge, some people had fled across the bridge. Many were too late. Caught up by the storm surge, they swam for their lives. The lucky ones scrambled onto floating roofs or doors that served as rafts. Hours later, they washed ashore. Meanwhile, the hurricane was charging along Long Island. The people in its path felt trapped in a nightmare from which they could not wake. The world had become unreal. Water swallowed houses. Roofs blew off. Pianos flew through the air. Birds racing to escape appeared to be flying backwards. Rising water drove people from the first floor of their houses to the second to the attic. Then houses collapsed. Boats tore loose, crashed into other boats and bridges. Trees fell, churches, steeples toppled, and through it all, the only sound that could be heard was the howl of the wind. Sometimes a scream, sometimes a deep bass, but mostly a pulsing groan. The hurricane rushed on across Long Island, sound to Connecticut, the city of New London lay in its path. Wind and waves smashed the waterfront with its boats, docks, building. Then somehow, fire broke out. Winds whipped the fire until the whole waterfront was ablaze. With telephone lines down, messengers struggled. Struggled on foot to the fire department. Firemen were slow to respond because streets were blocked by fallen trees and telephone poles. When they finally turned their houses on the fires, wind blew the water back at them. At one time, it seemed the whole city would burn. Then the wind shifted. 
fires were blown back at areas that had already burned. With no fresh fuel, they died out. Much of the Connecticut shore was spared a storm surge because Long Island acted as a breakwater. Long Island acted as a breakwater where the surge spit itself. Rhode Island had no breakwater. Rhode Islanders did have a warning of hurricane winds and heavy rains. But with telephone lines down all over Long Island, no word of the storm surge has spread. At one moment, people at Miss Quamacut were joking and putting up storm shutters. The next moment, their houses were under 30 feet of water. 41 people panicking on the beach. Wind and water stalled this Boston-bound train near Stonington, Connecticut. Most passengers escaped when the train crew heard them in the first car in the engine. The crew uncoupled the rest of the train and edged forward to safety. were swept away. After the storm, Miss Quamacut looked as if no one had ever soot, set foot there. At Napa Tree Point in Watch Hill, every house washed away. Survivors rode the wreckage to shore hours later. Providence, capital of Rhode Island, stands at the head of Nergaset Bay, 30 miles from the Atlantic. The storm surge ragged up the bay, snatched the lighthouse from Whale Rock, heard 20 tons boulders in the air, and as the bay narrowed, rose higher and higher. By the time it reached the head of the bay, the storm surge was a mountain of water, carrying boats and houses that came battering rams. Rushing water crushed the docks at the head of the bay. Hundreds of boats were torn from their mourning, slammed against one another, and turned into splinters. In downtown Providence, office workers were getting ready to go home when they looked out their windows and saw that the city was full of water. It rose to the height of first floor ceilings, trapping people in shops and restaurants. The sea took on an eerie glow as it swallowed automobiles and their headlights on. The storm surge swamped downtown Providence in 8 to 10 feet water. Note, people clustered on steps of the city hall, escaping from the flooded streets. Windows burst and broken glass was driven through the air. Chimneys crumbled in showers of bricks around people clinging to cars, lampposts, and trees. The hurricane sped up the Connecticut River Valley, tearing off roofs, shattered shop windows, filling trees, flattening crops with rain falling in torrents, steam swelling and burst over their banks, flooding towns along the Connecticut River. Volunteers labored in the wind and ran to... Stacked sandbags, hoping to keep the river within its banks. At Hartford Capital of Connecticut, the river rose 33 feet above normal. There were places where the river was held back. In other places, it jumped in banks and spread over fields and lawns into houses. Though the hurricane had rushed on north, the flooding went on for two days as water drained into the river and rushed downstream. The city of Boston was on The city of Boston was on the fridge of the storm, but it was shaken by winds of more than 100 miles an hour. At the airport, 
winds knocked down the radio tower and tossed an eight-ton airplane into a salt marsh half a mile away. Mount Washington, the highest point in New England, registered winds of 190 miles an hour. Lesser winds toppled whole forests in the mountains of Vermont and New Hampshire. Turning slightly west, the hurricanes howled over Lake Champlain, crumpling cottages and hurling boats ashore. So much rain fell that the whole lake rose two feet. By 11 p.m., the storm had crossed into Canada and was hammering Montreal, and winds dropped, but they still did widespread damage. A little more than eight hours after its first landfall on the barrier beaches of Long Island, the hurricane finally died out over Canada. In those few hours, more than 600 people died. Another 63,000 lost their homes. Countless automobiles and boats were destroyed. All along the storm's path, crops and livestock were wiped out, as were forests. Some 20,000 miles of telephone and electric wires were down. Rail services between New York and Boston halted until crews could rebuild bridges and remove hundreds of trees and telephone poles from the tracks as well as houses. Yachts and a 300 foot long steamboat. The U.S. Post Office borrowed a battleship from the Navy to haul mail between the two cities. With the passing of the storm, whether scientists began trying to understand what had happened, how and why had this monster of a storm reached Long Island and New England. Birth of a hurricane. Take a look at this. What causes the hurricane? First, warm air comes up into clouds. This is the water cycle. Warm ocean surface. Warm, moist air flows into a low pressure area 